Welcome to Mintel's Little Conversation podcast. Welcome to Mintel's Little Conversation, where our experts bring you fresh ideas and new perspectives on how consumers eat, drink, shop, groom and think. Each episode features a discussion of current topics from the latest consumer trends and new products to shifts in markets and lifestyles. I'm Andrew McDougall, Associate Director of Beauty and Personal Care at Mintel, and today we're going to be discussing beauty devices. And I'm delighted as well to be joined by Reiko, our Senior Beauty and Personal Care Analyst in Tokyo. Welcome, Reiko. Hello, Andrew. And we're also joined as well by the familiar voice of another Little Conversation host and our Senior Beauty and Personal Care Analyst based in London, Sam. Hello, Sam. Hello. Thank you both uh, so much initially just for joining me today. I know you're both sort of beauty device experts, so you seem to be the perfect pair um, to have on this to to discuss this today. Um, And with Clarisonic announcing in July that it is closing down the business after 10 years, it seems a relevant moment to talk about the beauty device category. Uh, We're talking about a brand here that's won awards, it's received dermatologist recommendation, it kind of gained this almost cult-like following of fans um, sort of across the globe, Um, and they, they were all kind of stunned at this announcement. So my first question to kind of open this up is, where did it all go wrong? What what kind of happened there? Yeah, I mean, I can start from a kind of Western perspective. So, I mean, in the UK particularly, we've seen usage of these devices hasn't really taken off in the way that we kind of expected. I mean, they've got a very niche and, as you say, cult following. Um, but beyond that, they've really failed to gain penetration. So we've not seen a growth in usage And so there's definitely an argument that there's kind of been a natural life cycle with the Clarisonic brush as more kind of, you know, more and more skincare uh, devices have come to market. There's been more competition um, and actually naturally people have kind of moved on to different, different kinds of devices. But then on top of that, you've got kind of, you know, rising interest in, I think, active ingredients in skincare. So consumers have kind of switched to, you know, more intensive routines and actually anything that's going to add to that abrasion and add to irritation is going to, it's become a, you know, it's become a bit of a trade off between, you know, minimizing skin irritation wherever possible, but still getting the most out of your skincare regime. I think the news was a big surprise for us in Japan too. The brand came to Japan in 2006 and stayed in the market until 2017. So most beauty conscious consumers would know about or heard about or have used their products. But I think the biggest challenge for them in this market in particular was to compete against established companies like Panasonic Beauty, Yaman, and MTG, who are known as the Japanese leaders in the beauty tech world. And another challenge for them, I would say, was to convince consumers that their cleansing brushes are gentle enough for the skin, just as Samantha mentioned. This is because many consumers here feel a bit nervous to use cleansing brushes brushes because they think they tend to think that it might cause further damage and even do more harm to the skin. We are educated to wash our skin thoroughly but gently from a very young age and beauty experts and brands are often advising us to wash quickly and gently with foaming lather. So yes, I think they did face a lot of challenges here in the market. Yeah, I think what, what you both say there is, is very true. It's very interesting to see how these products or these devices are positioned. Um, as Sam mentioned as well about sort of uh, looking at sort of active ingredients, having that uh, sort of collaboration now between device and product as well is also seems really important. Um, and it's interesting when you say, Raiko, about um, in Japan, because obviously Japan being one of the leaders in this market there, are, and as you, you mentioned, so many sort of big companies there. So there is a lot of competition. I know that here, even here in Europe, we have big competition in that space. Space as well. Uh, big brands such as Philips or Forio have sort of made these sort of beauty devices as well, which have also been very popular. Um, it is a bit of a surprise um, that L'Oreal have uh, sort of down tools with Clarisonic, um, but I guess the, the they did have a lot of competition. Some of it was a lot more inexpensive as well. Um, I know now that the Clarisonic has closed down, there's a huge sale on um, to get all those items uh, wrapped up. Um, but it, it is very, I think there's a lot of competition in the space. And it's definitely not to say that Clarisonic moved out of the space because it's a space that's going nowhere. There's definitely um, key drivers in the market um, going forward. And there's definitely a lot of key innovations. I mean, what would you say you see as the key drivers in this sort of beauty device market? I mean, as you, I mean, as you just touched on there, Andrew, I think being able to integrate these devices as seamlessly as possible into um, 
a skincare regime is so important. You need to kind of be discussing with your consumers how these work with the products that you're already using. They can't really add too much extra time or inconvenience into your regime. So I think the more simplified these um, devices can be and the more they can, as I say, the more discussion around how these work with, um, you know, with skincare products is so important. And I wonder whether we'll see more kind of collaboration between kind of, you know, technology brands and device brands with actual skincare brands because, you know, they're both experts. You know, we have brands that are experts in developing skincare products and we've got brands that are experts in developing um, devices but I w- we've not seen masses of crossover with anyone doing particularly well across both um, so I think there's definitely an opportunity there for either more collaboration or you know more innovation in terms of devices that work with products as well and discuss that and actively discuss that far more. I also think versatility is key for beauty devices in North APAC. In China, 57% of female beauty device users seek devices that will enhance the absorption of skincare products, which means that beauty devices will need to somehow fit into the consumer's current skincare routine. And also, devices need to be function-driven as 71% of Chinese women who have used or tend to use devices consider functional benefit as the most important purchase factor. This is the same for consumers in Japan where anti-aging benefits are so important when it comes to beauty devices. And I also think um, there is potential in wearable devices like Yaman's Medi Lift and MTG6 Pad, which offers further convenience and also allows you to do other tasks like washing the dishes and cleaning the floor while wearing the devices. And I think this is especially appealing to those who find it hard to put themselves first, like working mothers and even fathers. I love that concept of having a multitasking beauty device. So I, I would, I would definitely need that. I can't multitask um, for love nor money. So I would definitely need that kind of device to help <laughs> multitask um, for me as well. Uh, it's really interesting as well what you said <clears throat> about how with the collaboration. I also think um, there's going to need to be maybe more guidance. I think um, with beauty devices, it's kind of stepping away from that beauty gimmick. It's not just a device to use because it's novel. Um, I think you know, as you as you mentioned, Reiko as well. The the functionality becomes very important important um sam as well when you mentioned about the um sort of those collaborations and sort of those kind of products that work well with the devices as i say i wonder if social media could be a platform going forward to give that education we see so many brands in skincare and in hair care and in beauty in general uh, in color cosmetics as well so many sort of um video blogs or so many sort of tiktoks or do yin depending on which uh sort of uh, bit which market you're in. Um, but so many of these little uh, social media bits that really help to sort of bring to life the devices. So I wonder if that would help to sort of build that trust um, with consumers. Um, because as I say, sometimes it is that case of just stepping away from that sort of novel or gimmicky outlook. Uh, and that's just sort of one of the barriers or stumbling blocks that beauty devices have. I mean, what would you say, I mean, again, off the back of the Clarisonic news, but what would you say are the sort of the big barriers for beauty devices going forward? Uh, And do they now face added challenges as well with the COVID-19 pandemic globally, this sort of no contact world we're moving towards? um, Is is that going to have an impact now on beauty devices and sort of hygiene and things like that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we, we, what we've seen in the UK, I mean, we actually specifically asked about this. Um, and we do, we've got a really interesting stat which looks at kind of concerns over how hygienic devices, tools and accessories, so not necessarily just electrical devices, but how, you know, if whether consumers are more concerned um, about how hygienic their devices are. And what we did see is that there has definitely been a spike since, um, since COVID-19 in terms of consumers are a lot more concerned about hygiene. And obviously, it's an added cost as well, isn't it? So, you know, constant brush replacements, things like that really add to the cost. But then if hygiene is a concern, you're going to be one of doing that frequently. So that's definitely going to have created challenges, whether that played into... Um, you know, Clarisonic's, uh, L'Oreal's decision to kind of act Clarisonic um, or not, we don't know. But obviously, I think that's definitely going to play 
a big part. And as you say, I think one of the big challenges um, in terms of devices since you know, in the aftermath of COVID-19 is that a real income squeeze is going to make people really price sensitive. And actually these devices come at, at a significant cost for most consumers and with no real kind of guarantee that these are going to work for you as a consumer. I think that makes people very nervous. So I think it's going to be so important, as you said, you know, the social media aspect of it. And, you know, I think the one thing that we see is that, you know, the one number one factor that would encourage people to buy a new kind of beauty or grooming device or tool is recommendations from friends and family online followed by online reviews and then recommendations from beauty and grooming professionals so that word of mouth discussion is so important and I think on top of that there's a lot more that can be done to showcase actual Results. I think, I mean, you know, we've heard lots of discussion around how successful New Face has been recently. And I think one of the things that they're doing really well is communicating that kind of before and after journey. And it seems such a simple thing, but actually showcasing what these products are doing for real people is, you know, so is going to be so important. Yeah, I agree with you, Samantha. I think some of the products can be a bit pricey in Japan as well. So one of the obstacles for brands to overcome, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, is to prove that the products are worth investing in, but without the physical contact. So what Japanese brands did during the state of emergency was that they used live streams to connect their consumers with PRs and beauty experts who will introduce new products and tips on how to use them and live streams can help encourage and also gently push consumers who can't decide whether they should buy the product or not and brands can also benefit from the live videos by gathering real-time comments and feedbacks which also help them adjust and develop products that will match their consumers needs so to me it seems like a win-win situation yeah it definitely seems like the uh, as you mentioned sort of so many of the, the sort of the barriers is there um, and I think one of the big barriers that I mean we've spoken so uh, sort of more about uh, skincare devices there but um, as you know my love of hair care comes through and when it comes to hair care devices a lot of the time very similar to actually what you both said earlier actually damage can sometimes be a real problem for people they don't want to use a device that could potentially be more damaging um, in hair care we find that even more so with the, the heat damage and things and I think that's where brands like uh, Dyson have really been able to step in and again because they're a trusted brand I think having that trust is really good for overcoming those barriers um, as you mentioned earlier Sam as well having products that go hand in hand with skincare devices I think that's got to be something we move at going forward uh, as well as yeah, as you say the word of mouth um, I know that we have already seen dermatologist recommendations for some skincare devices but you're right it needs to be more in our world as well it needs to be the people around us sort of talking about you um, I know from personal experience as well that uh, from discussing with people about the Foreo skincare devices for example the amount of friends that I've had that have then gone and bought the Foreo device to use with it uh, and they have sort of differing feedback on it and it's really interesting just to see how that conversation all starts from a recommendation in sort of a peer group. Um, when we're talking about this, though, you, um, and you both mentioned sort of education and how we can sort of speak to consumers to overcome barriers. Um, and I know that the retail space is a very difficult one to predict right now because we don't know exactly how the world is going to sort of evolve over the next six to 12 to 24 months with sort of going back to normal retail. I say that in inverted commas. You can't see that on a podcast. Um but what are the best retail options then for beauty devices? I mean, in the UK, online is so important. So consumers are more likely to buy beauty and grooming devices online now than they are um, in store. Um, with online only retailers, the most popular type of retailer to purchase beauty devices, um, followed by health and beauty retailers and department stores. And I think, I mean, that mirrors the wider electrical goods market in the UK, which has very much shifted online um, in recent years because of the ease of access to things like product reviews, yeah, you know, breaking down functionality, you get far more detail in terms of products, you can read up, you can do your homework. And I think that's so important, but it also means that it adds a lot of price competition in the marketplace as well because people can obviously price check they can shop around they can wait for things like black friday to buy these devices at, on so um at a significant discount so i think that's a real challenge but it's also a big opportunity and really understanding how consumers um 
shopping for these devices is so important and understanding the importance of having all of that information at your fingertips. But on top of that, I do think there's still a role to play in stores. And I think what, you know, what we always kind of say is that, you know, multi-channel approach is always the best. So you don't underestimate how many consumers will see a device online and then we'll go and seek it out in store and vice versa and how many people will see something in store and go on buy it online so I think it's about making sure that you connect all of those dots um, you know we definitely know that more kind of retail space could possibly be given to these devices in store to give them a bit more more visibility you know you kind of get the token odd device being showcased in a department store here in the UK and you know I would imagine that is a significant driver of sales whether or not people buy it there and then physically in the department store whether they then go off and buy it online um, is another question but I think it's about understanding that kind of journey that consumers go in and making sure that as a retailer you're there at every touch point and you're finding that consumer so if they do go home and buy it online that they still want to come back and buy it online with you rather than going somewhere else. It's almost like that Catch-22 a little bit as well, isn't it? It's almost like they need more space to generate more sales, but they're not going to get the, more that more space until they've generated more sales. So it's a really difficult sort of um, sort of market to crack in that sense. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's something that we've discussed a lot, um, you know, just, we discuss a lot in retail is that there's, you know, there's very little distinction you know we always have this thing about kind of how many sales are made online versus in store but quite often a sale would not have been made if it wasn't for both channels and I think it's it's rapidly becoming an irrelevant distinction and I think in a, in a category like beauty devices I would imagine that is very much the case. Rico, how do we sort of see um, from a sort of the, the Asia point of view or in Japan in particular, how do we see the retail options for beauty devices? Are they different to what we see here in the West or is it, um, is it, is it roughly the same? I think it's similar here as well. It's true that online channels offer opportunities for new brands and product excitement. But in Japan, it's still quite important for consumers to get experience with the device before making their final purchase decision because as we mentioned before, the products can be a bit pricey. So here we have what we call beauty gyms. I think they are probably temporarily closed for now, but at the beauty gyms, consumers can trial various devices from at-home beauty devices to professional high-perform machines. Yaman actually opened its first facelift gym in Aoyama, Tokyo this year, where consumers can book a one-to-one -one session with a beauty trainer who can help them exercise their face using the devices. And I think this is an effective way to promote the devices because 41% of Japanese consumers are interested in beauty services that allow people to use an aesthetic machine on their own. I, I love that concept of a, a device gym, a beauty gym that I can go to. And I, obviously in a pre-COVID world, that works in a wonderful scenario. I guess hygiene and safety concerns come into play now. Um, mm -hmm. Is that something you think would work uh, here, Sam? Or is it something that is it something that you've seen actually already? Yeah, I mean, not we haven't seen masses and certainly not to that level, um, but there's definitely space for it. And you've only got to look at, you know, how engaged, you know, consumers really enjoy going into a really experiential beauty store. And it's part of the reason why, you know, for many years, the department stores did so well in the UK. We don't really have that kind of indulgent standalone beauty retailer in the UK where you can go and have that really immersive experience that we do in other regions, you know, with retailers like Sephora, et cetera. So we don't really have that, but you've only got to look at in terms of, if you look more towards the tech side of things, I think that's where you see how, how influential a really immersive, engaging store can be. And I think that's, you know, you've only got to look at brands like Apple and then take it right down to, you know, a big part of Dyson's success with, um, in hair care has been, you know, it's, it really has focused on that, you know, in store environment and how that product is showcased in store, which, you know, that it's, you know, obviously they don't have a massive footprint on that, but actually you engage a very small proportion of consumers in those stores and then they start talking about it and then you engage a much wider audience. So it's not like you have to have, you know, super immersive stores at every, you know, 
with a huge coverage across the UK because obviously that's not a reality for a lot of these devices. But actually, if you have one really amazing store where you create a lot of hype and create a lot of engagement around a product, I think that can be a really powerful tool. And as I say, I think the Dyson example is your kind of primary example there. Yeah, and I think I think you touched upon, well, you both touched upon there, just how important trial is as well with these devices. I think actually being able to try these devices, see how they work, use them yourselves can almost be again, to help overcome some of those barriers that people have. I think people need to to be able to trust something. They do need to be able to trial it. Um, and obviously, each device has each, a different function for each people. For example, um, skincare devices, as you mentioned, much more focused on functionality, results, uh, convenience, I think is probably quite important. Whereas I think, again, hair devices, I think focusing more on hair health and things like that, um, that used to use that Dyson example. Um, I don't know if you've been in the Dyson store, but I love going in the Dyson store in London just for the fact that, you know, you can just play with all the devices. As you say, it's a real sort of experiential um, sort of situation to be in. Um, that sort of brings me on as well, because you, you've been mentioning technology, we've been touching upon technology. Um, but do you see any sort of key innovations then in this beauty device market? Um, we know sort of the uh, influence of smart technology that could have and the development that that could have um, on uh, skincare devices and hair care devices as well, um, as well as also people's changing attitudes towards these devices, looking at sort of the at-home treatment world. Again, these devices can deliver that. And again, going back to the COVID-19 situation that we're currently going through, sort of at-home treatments and doing stuff at home has obviously been all we can do in, at certain moments in time. So are we now going to see this new so, so this sort of new uh, interest in skincare devices? Are there key innovations out there that you've seen? Yeah, I mean, as you, as you mean, as you just kind of touched upon that, there's definitely the COVID-19 situation has created a lot of challenges, but it's opened up some opportunities. I think we've seen a definite boost to devices that have helped people keep up appearances in the UK since um, since the start of the outbreak. So obviously, the very kind on a very simple, basic level, you know, things like gel, nail lamps and, you know, hair clippers have been the real winners um, since the start of it. But as it, we go forward, I think what's going to happen is we've got used to prolonging visits to hair and beauty salons. And I think anything, any kind of devices that really help and aid that um, and aid that process will be will resonate and I think communicating that with your consumers is is key so as you said things like you know hair, hair dryers on a really simple level that maintain your hair health and help you prolong your visits between salon visits will really resonate I think on top of that multifunctionality um, is really going to be in demand because obviously the more you can do with a device um the more value you get. It's, it's as simple as that, really. So, you know, on a really simple level, you know, we've got kind of things like um, We Are Paradoxes, Supernova, Cordless, three-in-one hair tool, you know, and it does multiple things and it can be used for multiple different kind of uses and occasions. So I think things like that, really thinking about multifunctionality, we've got the, I, I don't know how to pronounce it, the Nuo, Valus anti-aging microcurrent and light therapy device, which kind of incorporates two different technologies for different results. Um, and I think you'll see more of that. So really a real focus on multifunctionality just because of the sheer value for money aspect. In Japan, at home beauty devices started to gain popularity during the state of emergency due to COVID-19 because beauty salons were temp forced to temporarily close their stores. And there has been a lot of talk about new technology innovation during this market. But this year, MTG took a big step and moved into the sleep technology space. They launched a AI-powered mattress that monitors how you sleep and also helps you improve sleep quality by controlling the temperature and producing gentle motions. There has been a lot of talk about sleep tech promoting quality sleep and encouraging beauty sleep recently, especially because a lot of people were feeling stressed by staying at home and also because Japan has the shortest average sleep time in the world. The average sleep time in Japan is seven hours per day, whereas in the UK, it's 8.4 hours. 
and in China it's nine hours. So we are definitely not getting enough sleep, and it could affect our skin condition as well as our mental well-being in a way. I like that. It turns out we're really lazy, Sam. <laughs> we sleep for way too long. Um, I, I I always feel like I'm I'm always torn on uh, sleep because sleep quality I think is is such an interesting area to look at. And it's really interesting you mentioned that for beauty devices because it taps into that self care that wellness um, sort of concept that is really important right now. Um, as I say, I, I'm always torn on it though because I always, whenever I use these sort of devices to see how I've slept, I'm always then quite surprised at how badly I am as a sleeper. And it's kind of like, oh, okay, that's why I feel so terrible today. Um, but it is, but as I say, it's, it's one of those things again where, um, I mean, not even particularly on a beauty device, you have it on sort of uh, Fitbits and other sort of trackers, wearable devices that you mentioned before where you can find out about your sleep quality. And I think, again, that's a good way of stepping into that beauty device market by having these kind of trackers that show you what this can do for your health and what this can do, um, again, for your beauty going forward. Um, I guess a good place to end the conversation today, um, given that we've discussed beauty devices all the time, is to just to actually just ask you a very quick question um, about your own beauty device use, really. Are there any beauty devices that you do use? Um, I myself am much more of mainly just a hairdryer man. Um, I have, I remember uh, at the end of, uh, no, sorry, in the middle of last year, um, I was given the Neutrogena light therapy pen. I remember to uh, sort of take to clients and things like that. I remember sort of thinking, oh, I wonder if this works. Um, I'm not sure if it did. I don't think I'm the target audience for it. Um, I I don't have sort of acne, for example. But um, that was, again, a device that was, again, convenient, on the go. Um, To me, it was a little bit gimmicky because I didn't see the use of it. Um, But then I did also then give it to my wife, who then was just like, asked if she could then just have the product because she loved it um so yeah i was wondering what is your sort of experience with beauty devices um are there particular ones that you swear by yeah i mean for me i'm a bit like you i've always been more focused on hair tools um i was up until pre um lockdown i was an absolute user of you know would not go anywhere would not leave the house without straightening my hair and I think that's one of the things that's really changed for me and I think it probably I would imagine for a lot of other people is that actually I've learned to very much live without my straighteners and I think uh, with that I think what's been interesting for me is I've seen a lot on that's going to really challenge the hair device um, and hair tools market um, in future like things like you know I've been obsessed with all these various different you know things like the tiktok sock (laughs) curl challenge um and things like that and i think actually as you say i think it's going to be really interesting to see how it plays out things like that because actually whilst covid 19 has created a lot of opportunities i think it's you know very much changed device usage for a lot of people in terms of skincare i've always i've always kind of avoided skincare devices i just they make me a bit wary I don't trust I've got quite sensitive skin so I've always just kind of for me it's very much not about electrical tools and devices how about you Reiko I'm thinking because uh, Japan and Korea in particular have such uh, they're, they're like the leaders for patents for skincare devices I'm expecting you to have um, just a heavy usage of skincare devices is that true I'm a very low tech person <laughs> <laughs> But I am a big fan of lymphatic drainage. So my first beauty device I bought was um, Ayura's Bikasa Plate. It's a ceramic gua sha tool, which I'm still using. I, I like it because it feels really good and provides a super relaxing experience. I also recently bought the Corfit Face Pointer. It's a pen-shaped tool that is designed to apply pressure to certain points on your face, neck and shoulder to improve circulation. And I always have it on my desk when I feel tired or if I have a stiff shoulder, I'll just use it to relax. And I have one more device. I also own a MTG Reefa face roller, which is actually a hand-me-down from my mother. She owns, I think, about three or four of them. And she's a big fan of them. And she, it was a recommendation from my mother. So I also use that as well. I love how you said you were low tech and then you blew me and Sam out of the water by then saying all these different devices <laughs> that you had. But it's really interesting as well, given that, Sam, you spoke about um, how sort of you maybe have apprehension with sensitive skin to, fit to use certain devices. And at the same time, then, Rico, you're talking about how these are just great for relaxing. And you mentioned things like gua sha and things like that. Um, I know that it's not sort of a high tech beauty device, but things like those facial rollers as well, the jade rollers and the quartz rollers, uh, something that have been quite popular um, over the last sort of uh, year or two. 
Um, so it's really interesting just to sort of see how, again, the the devices, they connect with people in a different way. And I think relaxation and going down that self-care route could be a very interesting way forward. Yeah, definitely. Um, as you say, I think, I mean, I think on the um, the facial rollers and the grass tools, I think also helps that they're very Instagram friendly. Um, mm. And they look very pretty when people are taking their bathroom shelfy pictures or whatever else. So I think there's definitely maybe an element of that, especially over here in the UK, at least. So I'd be interested to see how many people actually have bought them and then not used them. <laughs> Yes, I think in Japan, also a lot of men are into the beauty devices recently as well. So we're all kind of um, expecting this market to grow more in the future. Well, thank you both very much for your insights. I'm afraid that about does it for today. Actually, we've uh, spoken for a little bit of time. Um, but thank you so much for your, for your input and your insight. Uh, to learn more about what we've discussed today or to learn more about Mintel, uh, then please do uh, visit uh, Mintel.com uh, where you can sort of read up all about COVID-19. You can read up all about um, what we've discussed today. We've got some great beauty device reports um, and then loads of other uh, beauty and personal care topics too. Uh, and also be sure to subscribe to Little Conversation wherever you get your podcasts as well um, a huge thank you to Rico and Sam uh, for both joining me today so thank you both so much for joining me today thank you so much for your insight so thank you Sam and thank you Rico and thank you all very much as well for listening have a great day Bye.